it's great to see everyone here. It's great to, I mean, we have a great event plan today. We have panels on all sorts of different aspects of 3D printing, as Martin said. This started, what, four years ago, five years ago, as a kind of single panel event where the panel theme was 3D printing. Uh, and now we've moved on to the place where we say, well, no, a lot of people know what 3D printing is. Let's talk about why it matters for policy. So we'll be talking today about all sorts of issues, medical applications, small business, distributed manufacturing, intellectual property law, and other legal issues. And it's great. I think it really shows a maturity of the technology, of the industry, and the community. And I think this is true of a lot of new technologies, but it's especially true of 3D printing, that it really has been incredibly community driven. There are companies, large and small, in this space right now, and they do, they do interesting things. I, I'm now at one. I'm, I, I recently left public knowledge to join Shapeways. But all of it really ties back to an incredibly vibrant and innovative community of people who are innovating not only in terms of making printers better, but also in terms of figuring out new things to do with those printers. And those, those paths are, are crossed and overlapping and very much build off of each other and respond to that. And I think that besides a kind of model of a great technology in the context of 3D printing, it's a really model, great model for what we see in a world of open participatory innovation and creation, and potentially, hopefully, a model that many more technologies and many more communities will be able to follow on in the future. And so it's trailblazing in a lot of different ways. Today, the first panel that we're going to have here at 3D DC is all about distributed manufacturing. And one of the interesting things about 3D printing is that we have now, we're now starting to see people who have access to these machines either at homes or at community centers or at libraries or hacker spaces taking this technology and saying, okay, well, you know, we can actually make things ourselves. We can download them from the internet. We can collaborate on physical things the way that we've all learned to collaborate on all sorts of virtual goods and try and figure out exactly how all of this, this works. And so I'm really excited about this panel. I'm going to allow the panel, we're going to go down the line and let them each introduce themselves and give you, uh, you know, two minutes or so, just kind of background as to where they are. And then we're going to discuss where distributed manufacturing and 3D printing are currently, and perhaps more importantly, where we all hope to see it in the future. We'll then have time for questions at the end. So uh, if you have questions, think about them, but hold them, and I promise that we will get to them. But with that, let me stop talking and let them talk, because they're much more interesting than I am. Uh, we're going to start and go down the line, and like I said, have you introduce yourselves, and then uh, we will roll from there with questions. So, Phyllis. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michael and Martin, and everyone for coming today. My name is Phyllis Klein, and I founded Fab Lab DC, which is part of a global network of Fab Labs. The project started at MIT as a community outreach component of an NSF grant. It was an accidental love child. Um, when the, uh, the crew at MIT saw how people flocked to have access to this technology, and they saw the high level of collaboration and enthusiasm and the ingenious things that were coming out of it, they couldn't help but wonder what would happen if this technology were made available to more people. So they boiled down the components of the mother lab into a suite of machines and processes and took it first to rural India and inner city Boston. And since then it's exploded. People want this in their own community. And if you can imagine this network of 500 plus now labs with more coming on every day, connected through the magic of the internet and a polycom where we can share knowledge and projects in real time over the internet. Um, we can collaborate. Instead of having to send a thing that we're working on, we send the data where if you're in Africa and I'm in Holland, you can print it out with my permission on site, on demand. So the potential for one-off, uh, one-of-a-kind, small-batch manufacturing and research, because it's not just you know, the technology being distributed among this network from the top down, 
The way the technology is being used and adapted for on-the-ground problems feeds back up to the high-level uh, research institutions to see how it's being applied. So the innovation is amazing, and as Michael pointed out, with 3D printing, uh, it was largely developed at this consumer level through open source groups, um, sharing information and developing the project until some people then take it out and, and commercialize it. But I, I really would like to underscore that 3D printing is one component of a suite of machines and technologies that enable us to do rapid prototyping. Before it was not uh, accessible to us, it was beyond our reach, we didn't have the funding, we didn't have the resources, but now with not only additive 3D printing manufacturing, but with subtractive, with laser cutting, CNC routing, mini mills to make your own electronics, um, you know, you can really have a whole suite. So I would, the, the analogy's been made that um, the 3D printer is kind of like the microwave oven in your kitchen. It's an awesome tool, but you wouldn't use it to make the whole meal. And so uh, if you look in a little bit to, to uh, uh, this type of uh, digital fabrication, you'll see that with many of these spaces, whether it be a hacker space, maker space, the library, and fab labs, there's a suite of machines where if you can think it and you can render it in a computer-aided drafting program, these machines can cut it, etch it, extrude it, um, you know, actually rapidly prototype it for you. So uh, there's plenty more info, but I want to pass this along to my colleague, Todd. And actually, Todd, before you start, and just for those of you who don't spend a lot of time in congressional office buildings, uh, Congress is in session right now. When you hear those those buzzes, uh, those are signals for various votes and things happening on the floor. It does not mean that Godzilla is coming and we're in a lot of trouble. So uh, feel free to ignore them. You'll know when you when there's an alarm that you need to pay attention to. And and hopefully, it won't be today. I thought a cane was going to. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> so um, don't worry. Also, there are lights on top of all the clocks. Those are also that, which is all things that you can ignore. Great. Um, my name is Todd Blatt. I'm a maker, hacker, 3D modeler, mechanical engineer. Um, I've been interested in 3D printing since I first saw it in 2000 on a high school field trip. And, you know, back then it was, we had to go to a defense contractor, and, you know, check in. It was this big, giant warehouse, and we got to, like, walk by it. But now, like, People have them at home, and you can use it every day. That's, you know, that's what's really exciting to me. So I, will, I also work for Tinkering Studios, and we're a 3D printer manufacturer in Vancouver. So it's a public company based in Canada. And then I run a project called We the Builders, which is a crowdsourced distributed manufacturing platform where, well, basically that means that everybody who, want, who has a printer already can go to the website and download a block and print it out and then mail it to me and these blocks get glued together into a big, giant, awesome sculpture. So, so far we've made two uh, busts of George Washington and of Benjamin Franklin. And these are huge sculptures, like a meter tall, that are like giant things, and each block's a different color from a different person. We had parts from France and Beijing and you know, all over the US and the UK, and uh, it's just really neat that everyone can work together now on the same project. And you know, the point of We the Builders was to show you know, the world, like, hey, everyone can work together on one solution. And that's just been really exciting for me. Um, and at Tinkering, one of the things we focus on is education, so we're able to have, you know, we can develop lesson plans and curriculum in one place and then share it online for free to other people who want curriculum, so people who can bring 3D printing into the classroom. And then those people and other educators can develop curriculum and then share it with other people. So it's this in a distributed platform where anyone anywhere can you know, create something and share it quickly and easily. So we saw how that affected the music industry. I think most people nowadays don't go to the store and buy CDs or tapes or you know, albums. It's all, you know, you can make it and then have it for sale online or have it available online for other people the same day. So I mean, I'm a, I'm a big user of Shapeways you know, for the last, I guess since 2009 is when I first started. And it's the same idea where one person somewhere can create something and then have it for sale and have it be able to you know, be shipped anywhere. So it really allows individuals to compete with big companies because now you don't need this, this manufacturing process where you have to have a relationship with a factory or you, know, you can just upload a thing and have it for sale right away. Um, 
And I mean, one of the good examples I have of that is when I made these accessories for Google Glass. Like, it's a small niche product, and it was like a, not a lot of people have it, not a lot of people need it. But I was able to make you know, a thing that people needed and have it for sale the same day online, you know, anywhere. So it's been pretty neat with, with only like an, an hour or two of work that you can have a product available. Um, the, the future is very exciting to me. Oh, uh, my name is Zach Leach. Uh, I'm with the 3D Hubs. Hi. Uh, so we have uh, the largest network of 3D printers in the world, and uh, essentially what that means is uh, right now 16,000 printers uh, in over 150 countries, uh, both desktop machines like MakerBots, uh, as well as uh, larger service bureaus who have you know multiple. Uh, Stratasys or, or 3D systems type machines uh, and we connect anyone who wants to print anywhere in the world with a 3D printer. Um, it's, a, it's a basic concept but it has a lot of implications uh, for you know what 3D printing is going to mean for manufacturing down uh, the line. Uh, we, we provide anybody uh, with a 3D file with production on demand uh, whether they're in Iraq uh, or Washington or anywhere else uh, around the world. Uh, that's, that's the basic spiel for, for our company. <laughs> Great, thank you. I want to get into the experience with various aspects of distributing and manufacturing because I think we have three great cross sections of this. You know, Phyllis is in a fab lab watching people print things and learn. Uh, Todd has run, among other things, he's run a distributed manufacturing process. And Zach is to kind of seize a distributed network from a position that very few people can. But Todd, I want to start with you. Uh, that project, and for those of you uh, who can't picture this, Ben Franklin will be, will be around for the reception today, uh, starting at 5.30. It is amazing. It is giant and uh, crazy in many ways. This is the second project you've done with, with distributed manufacturing, where you, you literally said, we're going to make one thing, and we're going to distribute the manufacturing of it to as many people as, as we can. What surprised you in that process, especially going from the kind of first, from George Washington, which was the first one, to Ben Franklin, what were the lessons learned? What worked? And probably more usefully, what didn't work? What were the things that you said, we thought this was going to be fine, and it, it turned out to be much more complicated than we thought? Um. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of prep work, so people, I guess, don't realize that, but it was a lot goes into getting a project up the line, as well as, you know, maintaining it as, as people are printing and checking out parts and things. It's not, it's not just a web, web page where all the parts are listed and anybody, anybody can print whatever they want. So there's a whole back end that we had to develop to, like, assign this part to that person and, like, a check process to make sure that what they printed is the right size or you know, didn't um, make a mistake or something. But... Uh, what, what did really surprise me was how well the whole process worked. We, we did the whole George Washington sculpture. We scanned the replica of, I mean, we scanned the original <coughs> sculpture of George Washington in Toga in the <coughs> Washington Monument in Baltimore. And then we cut it off, made the website, and everything. It was all three weeks total, including the printing and the shipping and the gluing all together. So how well all the parts came together really surprised me. Where, I mean, you look at it, it looked like it was, I mean, it was, but it looks like it was all planned out to be that way. Um, I mean, I tried to bring it here last year to the show, but somebody uh, metal plated one of the parts, so it couldn't fit in the X-ray machine and setting off the metal detector, so we weren't able to, to bring it in, but it bends in two separate parts and can fit through it, but in the, the back way this time. Um, but yeah, just you know, preparing it and making sure, like one of the things that took a lot of effort was labeling each part, because I would not have, I probably would have been able to do it, but I wouldn't have been able to do the whole project in such a short amount of time if the parts weren't labeled. So everybody gets a, a block and it says, well, this is part, you know, 642. So it's like 6 over and 4 up and 2 blocks back. So without those labels, I, I think the project would be, it's a very difficult puzzle even when they're labeled because you have to, I guess, three-dimensionally you have to rotate the block and you have to figure out which orientation it goes and which rotation it goes in. Um, but it was just really surprising. <coughs> that all the people wanted to reach out to us and you know, help and news sites would write about it and people would log in. And, um, but we do see we get a big burst of interest right when we launch a project and then towards the end there might be only you know, 15 people up in the beginning of this, you know, 75 or 150, it was you know, a lot. 
And Phyllis, you're, like I said, you're kind of on the ground when we see people, traditionally, at least in the last century, we think of creating things as something that happens in a very centralized way, uh, with a, a large factory or something like that. Now that people can come into a fab lab, and I'm glad that you flagged that 3D printing is important, 3D printing is amazing in a lot of ways, but it's one tool of many when you think about digital fabrication and manufacturing. When people come into a fab lab, what are they, what do they have in mind initially that they want to create? And then once they've been there for a while and they've learned the tools, what are the kinds of things where they say, now that I have this capability, this is what I want to be able to do with it? Yeah, I think um, to Todd's point, the social component of uh, this type of um, movement is amazing. At Fab Labs, uh, because each one is unique, depending on the community, depending on the location, um, when people come to the Fab Lab, they may be coming out of curiosity. They may be total neophytes, but by familiarizing themselves with the processes and some of the projects, it becomes an inspiration. It sparks ideas about what is possible. Um, you know, the things people make can be for the economy of one, for themselves. They might make something um, that they think is just for them. But in the proof positive process and in this uh, environment where you have a cross section of a diverse group of people, um, typically uh, you find a lot of other people are interested in the thing that you're making. Um, whether it be a piece of jewelry, whether it be a medical device, whether it be, uh, and, and really the things people make span all realms and, and disciplines, uh, from education to uh, medical devices, um, things that make their lives simpler um, or more manageable. Um, a few examples um, in Barcelona Fab Lab, uh, the Smart Citizen was developed. It's a microprocessor that allows regular citizens to measure um, toxins and environmental uh, uh, hazards in your own community. And you might think, well, you know, that's great for, uh, for over there. Um, I happen to have the experience with a huge construction project coming up next to me right in D.C. where there was a lot of uh, exhaust and output coming right next to my home, but the D.C. Department of Environment could not measure it. They didn't have the capability. But guess what? I could buy Smart Citizen, and it's not just that I could buy it. It's an open source project where people are developing it. Not only are they developing it, but all the data that we collect can be shared in a collective place where we can see what the health and, and uh, hazards are in different cities around the world. Um, additionally, not only are individuals creating things, but Barcelona has actually become a fab city where they've committed to creating multiple fab lab hubs all around the city. We hope to do the same through, as we heard yesterday, the White House has commitments from mayors around the country to think about uh, new ways of manufacturing. So people come as individuals, they come as groups, um, they come as small entrepreneurial companies, um, the draw is to learn these processes and see how they can apply it. So sometimes you come with a specific project in mind and you pick the tool that most serves the, the purpose. Other times you come and really, I've had this experience too, just being in the environment, um, it, it becomes a, a source of inspiration and ideas by seeing what's possible. Yeah, absolutely. I think anyone who's been to one of those facilities has had that experience of kind of the world opening up to you. Yeah, and also, uh, to Todd's point, whereas he sourced and people sent him things, uh, there's great potential to save a lot of energy, save all those complicated processes about, you know, interstate, uh, inner uh, country, you know, working across oceans, working with customs. If I can send you the data, that's fine. If I ship you everything, that can take, you know, months and sometimes years to get through to get to you. So... Absolutely. So Zach, I mentioned earlier, I mean, you're kind of at a, a point where you can see a lot of these networks forming and coming together. And you have a network of printers all over the world that have all sorts of different capabilities. When people tap into that network, what is, and I'm sure there's nothing like, like your ideal user or your average user, but what are people doing with this technology 
when they have access to it, because access is, is part of the equation, but it's certainly not the end of the story. Right. Um, so there's a big debate uh, as to whether the technology will stay uh, uh, for designers uh, and architects and basically uh, people who are doing prototypes, which is, uh, you know, for decades what the technology has been used for. Uh, that's still the case. Uh, you know, we see that looking at the tens of thousands of parts that come through our platform every month. Uh, the majority of those parts uh, are for product designers, uh, architects, industrial designers, people who are doing uh, iterations in their R&D. Um, but they are also making uh, gadgets for their GoPro uh, devices, for their uh, phones, uh, printing jewelry. Uh, so the consumer aspect uh, is there. Uh, it's growing. Uh, consumer brands are also dipping their toes in the water. Uh, they really don't know where uh, to begin. So it's, it's uh, the job of, of myself and of, of Shapeways to, to teach them. Um, th those are really the two areas uh, that, that we see. Uh, when you get into the high-end industrial uh, grade printers, you know, you're already seeing uh, end-use parts in, uh, in like the Scan Eagle, for, for uh, uh, an example, which you know, the Navy uses for reconnaissance purposes. Um, so it's being put into... Um, high-grade applications, um, you know, uh, for example, Carl Bass, uh, who runs Autodesk, which is, uh, you know, playing very large in this space, uh, said a few months ago that he doesn't think uh, that the technology will really be um, used uh, highly in the consumer space, um, and that's kind of been, you know, an area that people have gone back and forth on. Um, the trend line on our platform uh, is, is skewing a little bit towards that, um, but not quickly enough to contradict uh, what he said. So, so mainly it's still uh, designers using it for the purposes of research and development. I want to ask you all kind of a, a challenge question, and a question that, that maybe challenges the premise of this panel entirely, which is, if you think about the story of the Industrial Revolution, the story of the Industrial Revolution was a story of centralizing manufacturing, right? Of you had you had artisans, you had people who were who had cottage industries in their, in their cottages. They were designing, they were building things very locally, and there were a number of forces that pushed manufacturing to a central place. With that as the kind of paradigm that we have known for the last century, two centuries, you know, however long you want to think about it, why does this distributed model make sense? And when does this distributed model make sense? Why should, why should people be taking this seriously as an option? Anyone? Well, I'll start. Um, the world's changed. Uh, consumers, you know, and we've been counted as consumers instead of citizens for a few decades now. And this is sort of a, a synthesis of not only being a consumer, but also being the citizen, where you can use this technology to solve problems within your own community or create those cottage industries, whether it be full-time or part-time. If you have an idea, you're able to have access. Um, with our concerns about sustainability and the environment, um, you know, where people talk about uh, their, their carbon footprint. If you don't have to ship something from a central place, you can have it manufactured through this distributed network where even though I'm sending my file to Shapeways because I want it to be in this incredible material and professionally done, Shapeways is contracted with somebody right in my neighborhood, most likely, or very nearby. So it's not coming from far away. I think the other thing that, um, you know, comes to bear is um, demand. You know, how many of you uh, are interested in having more customizable products, the shoes that fit you just right? You know, uh, this type of technology is bringing that kind of possibility within our realm. Maybe you don't want the, the earrings or the, the product that everybody else has. You don't want that mass manufactured thing. And for the maker themselves, whether you're the designer architect or whether you are, or just have a good idea that you want to test out, um, the thing is you get to touch it. You get to see it along that process until you feel 
that it's at the point where maybe you want to scale it. Maybe you don't want to scale it. Maybe you just want to make small batch because all your friends and family want it. Um, but you also have the option then to take it to a higher level if you need mass manufacturing. So I think those are a lot of reasons why people are now interested in taking part in manufacturing and also um, taking part in telling um, this new uh, ilk of manufacturers what they actually want. This whole movement toward human-centered design and having a choice and uh, not making so many things that just become inventory in, in a place someplace or become waste. Um, in essence, you can create things on site, on demand. You don't have to make a bunch and store them somewhere. Yeah, when you're making a whole lot of the same thing, you have, when you're making cars and you get one big giant factory and you put it in you know, one spot and you make the same thing over and over again, but when you're making 16,000 different products that are you know, different each day, then it's great to have 16,000 different places to make it and then they're already where they need to be. You just send the raw material to that location and then you know, the printer can print that thing for the person that's you know, in walking distance. That's you know, the 3D helps model where it's like, you know, if I need one thing that's right nearby, I can go and get that. And uh, what's neat is that these factories are kind of two-way streets because somebody who operates a printer also can design a new thing. So if they share that thing, then it like can instantly transport. It's like teleportation, where you you have a thing here, and then all of a sudden it's you know on the other side of the world, and that's that's what's really exciting. Um, uh, yeah. So I, this is kind of a fun example, but I do think it's practical. I'm sure many of you saw the International Space Station received a file that was, I believe it was a wrench uh, that they're able to print in space. Um, you know, you can take that uh, and bring it back here down to earth and, uh, you know, if you need whether um, a spare nail or uh, a spare uh, screwdriver, you can now print these things on demand. Um, materials are uh, going farther and farther out uh, in terms of uh, their complexity. Uh, obviously, it's, it gets more expensive to turn in, uh, in metal um, and uh, in nylon. Uh, but as the materials uh, continue to evolve, uh, the, the tools that we can use um, become greater and greater. Uh, so I think it's, it's the ability to have things that you need on demand. Um, also, a speed in, in R&D I don't think should be overlooked. You know, large uh, companies who have had the resources have been able to take advantage of this for years. But uh, smaller companies can, uh, can do this now as well. Uh, where if they need to do five or six iterations, uh, they can go uh, to Shapeways or they can go to 3D Hubs uh, and they can take advantage of the technology. Uh, and customization, which was touched on earlier, uh, it really uh, doesn't, it, where with injection molding, you know, you may need to make uh, five or 10,000 parts and have it uh, shipped over. Uh, with 3D printing, you can make that part uh, on demand and in a, a single form. Uh, so I think uh, speed, uh, the, the on-demand nature of, of production and uh, customization are, are two uh, huge value adds uh, with uh, AM additive manufacturing. Yeah, I, I'd just like to add quickly, um, the FAT Foundation is also working with some of our governmental agencies. When you think of these applications in defense where typically the supply chain you know, can take years and years, but you need something right away, whether it be on the battlefield or at an emergency response center, uh, these technologies are coming into play, which you know, are, are a real benefit. But I, I would also ask, how many of you are factory workers or, or have worked in a factory? And how many would do you, would you aspire to work in a factory? Uh, factory work, uh, you know, is has a, a reputation of being mind numbing and boring, and uh, that may or may not be the case. But there's a lot of people who are interested in manufacturing, but they're interested in changing the paradigm. So you know, as as Todd was pointing out, your role is compressed, so you become you know the uh, conceptual person, uh, the, uh, the designer, the production person, and the marketing. So it opens up so many opportunities for people to, to get involved. And it also, um, you know, these, these types of technologies 
don't necessarily create more jobs in the factories, they reduce jobs, they just create specialized jobs for people who know how to use this type of equipment. Um, so anyway, those are a couple uh, things that have been noticed across the field, uh, just in terms of the draw of what the demand is for, for people's changing needs. Yeah, and we'll hear more about this in the next panel, but you know, when you when you hear these prosthetic hands that people are printing out and <coughs> kids who are born without hands, like you need to actually do things to the print after it's printed. So a lot of people expect this 3D printer makes whatever you want, but a lot of times there's you know additional screws that you have to add or assembly that has to be done or you know strings and elastic bands and Velcro that you add. So when you have these kids that need to come and get fitted with a hand. You know, it's better to have it more distributed instead of everyone come to one location and we'll, you know, all wait in line and put the hands together there. Um, so, I mean, one of the efforts that I was able to help, um, uh, Maria Escuela, who's here in the audience, and I met at a Baltimore Enable conference, and we followed up with a series of events where people from, I, mean, I put a message out to the We the Builders group and to and anybody I know online who had a 3D printer to print out these parts needed for a prosthetic hand and mail it to this church in Baltimore and we're going to and, we, and what we were able to do is get hundreds of hands and build, build them and teach the scouts how to teach other scout troops and have those scout troops you know uh, I think it's this weekend that the, there's Canadian scouts coming down and we're teaching the scouts here how to teach the Canadian scouts how to build the hands and you know that's something that's you know distributed that everybody can come together and print these parts that wouldn't work if it was just one centralized location because you know you need all of the you know working hands to build the new hands and fit them to the kids that, that need it. So I mean that's that's one of the really inspiring things where you know we the builders kind of started as just a cool idea. Let me you know assemble people who want to work collaboratively on a project. But then when this opportunity came across where we could start you know printing out these hands for people and really make a difference and make something useful instead of just you know something pretty to look at, that's been really inspiring too. Yeah, there's other uh, groups. I mean, there's something called 100K Garages, which is a collective of people who have this type of equipment, and they post themselves online, so it's regional. So if you need something made, uh, you can locate the person with the 3D printer, with the CNC router, with the laser cutter. Um, and again, uh, it's distributed. People make themselves aware through the internet, uh, through these networks so that the, um, the economy grows from the opportunities of connecting us all together in this way. It's funny, I was talking to my brother on Monday. And he, about a year ago, he moved out of Brooklyn to the Catskills to open a, a bed and bar. Which, if you're interested, I can get you a great way to con. But he was lamenting how you know, it was spring, and so you know, they were kind of switching over seasons, and all this stuff kept breaking, and it all was random things that had just pieces that were breaking off and he had to wait weeks to get, you know, these like small pieces that were mission critical, but it wasn't, it wasn't expensive, it wasn't complex, it was just, they were a special piece for the thing. And, and, and he was saying, I don't know how these guys in the spaceship do it, on the space station do it, because yeah, everything breaks all the time. I said, Stephen, you know, we need to get you a 3D printer and it may be able to help you solve these problems without waiting for civilization to reach the Catskills, uh, whatever case that it does. So no offense to the Catskills. It's, here's lovely. I'm going next week. Um, so I want to ask, you know, when we think about these models, when you think about distributed manufacturing and all these, these stories and these use cases, is this something that is going to compete with traditional manufacturing? Does it complement traditional manufacturing? Does it exist kind of stovepipe completely separate? What is its relationship to manufacturing and fabrication as we know it traditionally today? Um, I think on the consumer end, it's, it's going to be a long time. Um, and I say that mainly because of the uh, consistency of the quality of the products. So the output uh, of industrial 3D printers uh, can give you, uh, a, you know, a few hundred uh, toys a week. You know, you put uh, 10 of them in a room, sure, you have, uh, you know, a few thousand parts. Um, but when you, st we're talking about distributed here, so if you have a few machines in Boston that are working and a few machines in Chicago, um, they can produce pretty much the same piece that comes out, but it's not going to be exact. Um, and that, um, unfortunately, 
uh, for us is something that the consumer brands um, don't like. Uh, but when it comes to short and medium uh, batch runs of products, absolutely. Um, I think it's, I actually think we're already there on a, on a daily basis. I work with companies who, who call us for these things. Um, we've seen an influx of it just in the last few months. Uh, whether it's uh, promotional items um, or uh, uh, consumer brands want to design their own products in-house and then put it on the web, they don't have to order uh, 10,000. They can produce them on demand, and we can make we can make 500 in a week if we have to. But when you're getting into uh, 10, 100,000 pieces. Um, it's it's just not there yet, and I don't know if you guys agree or disagree, but it's going to be five, probably ten years out before that really becomes the case. So I think uh, growing up and probably still today, my favorite Halloween holiday was Halloween because we had so much candy and so many different kinds of candy. And nowadays, when you go and you, you go trick or treating, which I'm sure y'all do, you get the same like <laughs> you get Snicker bo Snickers bars and you get. Three Musketeers and M&M packets, and it's the same thing that you get from Walmart that everyone else gives out. But when I was little, I remember like spreading them all out on the floor, and there was a hundred different kinds of candy. I mean, I was still little and didn't know all the candies that existed, but the variants back then versus the variants that I see today, like I don't go to Subway, I don't go to Pizza Hut, I don't go to these you know really common chain kind of restaurants because I don't like seeing the same thing over and over. And with 3D printing and with all these different new creators that don't have to have that deal with Mattel or deal with the factory where they only make you know, 20 new toys a year or something like that where it's not Toys R Us where there's the, it's just the same thing over and you can only get those brands and there's only those you know, six toy companies or whatever it is. It's, you know, it's each designer can make the new thing that's in their brain and that's why I love 3D modeling because it, it lets you take the crazy thoughts that you have in your head and share it with the world and show everyone like this is that cool thing that I just designed and, and I'm able to compete with big companies the same scale by designing the things I want and you know, allowing for more different choices. That's what I really love about you know, this technology. Uh, I don't think big factories are going away, uh, nor would we want them to because there's a place for them. And uh, there has been great interest on the part of big business about what they, what has been you know, tagged the disruptive technologies, you know, oh dear. Uh, we're going to be undone because uh, people can make a uh, similar or more desirable product in their garage or their home. Um, I think that there's a place for both, uh, but to the point about you know the larger industries being interested in this technology, um, you know many of them are producing the, the 3D printers. You know they've gotten in the business, and I think too that. Um, uh, for instance, at the World Economic Forum, for uh, two of the sessions running, we've actually set up a fab lab there, and so the you know the biggest and the richest have come to to see this, and and what and they were pondering what effect this would have on you know traditional manufacturing and business. So I think they've been really interested in. Uh, what's happening, particularly as it's labeled disruptive, how it might interfere. But more and more, I see uh, collaborations. I see the entrepreneur developing their prototype, getting it to a certain point where they can actually sell the idea or turn the manufacturing over uh, to uh, a big company. And, and you know, much of the uh, uh, manufacturing happens abroad, you know, in China. Um, so. There's some of the that, that we can do here um, as we're developing it and as the others have said with small batch and with personal manufacturing. Um, but there are uh, factories right here in the U.S. that are implementing digital fabrication as part of their manufacturing um, process, um, quite a few. In terms of 3D printing, I wholly agree that at the consumer level, this isn't like just plug and play, like it's not the Star Trek replicator now where I can just push a button and say I want a bottle please. I mean, I can download things from Thingiverse or other open source um, sites that the file's already done and it will print it out for me, so I could do that. But if I truly want to create something that's unique, I have to know how to use uh, 3D modeling and software to be able to do that. Um, but Again, in this whole line and chain, I can have an idea, but with these uh, networks, I can 
find the expertise and people willing to um, either share in that process or to teach me how to do it because distributed education is a whole nother part of this and it's a huge um, <coughs> opportunity. We have something called Fab Academy where um, it's modeled on MIT graduate level courses where you tune in between June and May once a week for a lecture and people all over the world tune in and then you carry out the assignments in your local lab. So the knowledge is being distributed, more people are having the skills and more incredible inventions are coming out of it. I just want to add, uh, it was brought up that you know designers have the ability to make their own things, basically download something from Thingiverse uh, and we call it remix it. Um, that's what's making its way into corporate boardrooms and uh, management teams at big companies. Their products are already being uh, messed with, and they know it. Uh, so the very progressive ones, it's, it's under a percent, but the, but the very progressive large companies are coming to companies like ours and saying, it's risky, uh, you know, we may lose our intellectual property on these items, but we want to test the waters. We want to see if there's another, if this is a new way to engage our customers who already exist in the millions. Many of them have registered with us. So we know who they are. We know the products they have bought. So if we know that uh, these five products are being remixed uh, dozens of times over and being printed uh, via uh, Fingerverse and then 3D Hubs or Shapeways, then let's, let's endorse that. Uh, let's allow them to do that, let's put our name behind it, and let's let them produce that piece in Shanghai or in New York or in LA. Um, it's quietly happening, uh, but it is happening. Um, and I think their biggest fear is that they lose control of their monetization. Uh, but when I talk to them, I tell them it's just a new way to monetize. And I mean, you can either figure it out and go along with it, or or not, and, and then you lose. You know, that's up to you. Yeah, and I, I love this because um, one of the things this panel is doing is, is flagging a bunch of things that we're going to have panels later on. So we're going to talk about education because the education component is incredibly important. Uh, we're going to talk about IP because the IP stuff is uh, is important. is an important question. Now we're I mean, we're here in Washington, and so I want to ask kind of my last question to you before I open it up to the floor for questions. Is, is a policy question. You have, you have a room full of people here, many of which are, are Washington policy people. If you want them to know one thing or be thinking one thing about how this technology works, how it's evolving, what's happening, what they could do to help, um, what is that thing? What do you want them to take away from, from this, especially in the context of distributed manufacturing? Get this into mainstream education, you can start in kindergarten. It's really important for people to understand how things work, how they're made, hands-on education, self-directed learning, and um, you know, having the adventure of discovering things for oneself. Yeah, I agree about education. It's a uh, you know, very important thing, especially at Tinkering. Um, we've got all this course content and lesson plans online that, you know, it's all free, and teachers can incorporate the content, lesson plan, and curriculum into the classroom. So I think it's really important that you know younger people. I mean, it's all written at an eighth grade level, so it's it's really important that younger people know that this technology exists. And of course, not everyone's going to go into design. Not everyone needs to be a product designer. You know, not everyone needs to know geometry and you know all the different maths that we took. But it's important that you know that it exists, so that you know that you know if you have an idea for a product or if you have something that you want to make, you know the, you have the stepping stones, you have the, you know, the, the right footing to stand on to, to get started in that. So just being exposed to it at an early age, you know, can do great things. I mean, for example, for me, I got exposed to it in middle school when I started 3D modeling, and today I can, you know, make whatever I want. So imagine a society where, like, so many people knew how to do, knew how to use these tools, knew, knew where their, you know, local makerspace was, and where they could go to you know, have access to technology and how to use it to. I mean, it would be a really different place, and I think the, you know, the job force would be a lot different if you didn't say, oh, I don't know how to do that. I'll tell someone else how to make it, and someone else should make it. Um, but if you can do it yourself, you know, if you had that know-how, then it would 
can be a really different place. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, jobs uh, and security is a big one, which I'm sure someone else will touch on later. But training people how to operate these machines, because that's not an easy thing. So that's uh, you know the technical uh, schools. I know the, the Department of Education is working on that. Um, content creation, you know, design, uh, I think, uh, is also a useful tool uh, for, for schools to teach their kids. Uh, but, but also um, the ability to uh, understand, and I don't want to use the word track, but, but be aware of what's being made. Um, you know, there are, there are disadvantages to this, and that is the ability for anyone in this room to create something that could harm the public. Um, and it is Washington's role to uh, protect the public. So I would be, and, and I know they're paying attention to it already, but with, without stymieing uh, the innovation that's going to come along with this, but being responsible uh, from a policy perspective to protect people. Yeah, and uh, when, when we think about the thorny problems that we're facing in terms of uh, education, the economy, um, crime, uh, Again, the social component of bringing people together to solve problems, and if they have the literacy that's required, um, one of the really inspiring aspects of, of the Fab Lab project is that it's gone into places and neighborhoods where um, there's been you know, very direct ramifications of these problems. When you take a young person who's failing at traditional education and you put them in an environment where you know uh, they can realize ideas that they have, you know that type of empowerment, it's it's really engaging a whole echelon of people who beforehand didn't have role models, didn't have opportunities. Um, there's an amazing example of this in Detroit. If you look up Insight Focus, it's the Detroit Fab Lab. Um, check it out sometime. It's, it's just amazing uh, the transition of people who have been over reliant on, uh, you know, the, the justice system, welfare, who looked at the world as, a, you know, a place of, um, you know, shortage. They weren't included in processes. This is turning that around. So uh, when we think of social policy and opportunities and creating. Um, not just a workforce, again, but a citizenry that takes pride and stock in solving the problems that are part of our, our common um, concern. Well, thank you. So at this point, I want to open the floor to questions. I will issue the standard Washington disclaimer, which is questions end in a question mark, not a period. So <laughs> thank you all. Um, and yeah, just raise your hand. We are, we're, we're all friends here. It's a small enough room. We don't need mics or anything like that. Uh, so just uh, please uh, let us know and we'll go do a couple questions and then we'll move on uh, in the back. Hi, yes. Uh, my name is Arv Agosti and I have a Weedy Hub in Virginia. Uh, my question in terms of policy is uh, IP, what is being done to protect uh, my hub, I get orders all the time. I don't have time to check if there's a patent behind it or somebody has a copyright or whatever. Uh, so, uh, what is being done currently to address that issue of, as to who's responsible? I've spoken to somebody in the music industry, IP uh, experience in the music industry, and they said at this point, both the person sending me the 3D file and I as the printer will be liable if whoever created or has the IP decides to sue. So I'm just curious, what is the latest development in terms of legislation on that? I think the first answer is mark 130 down on your calendar. You have a whole panel on IP and intellectual property. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I will, if, if the panel wants to respond, I'm happy to let them respond. But we're going to be talking about that in depth later on. I'm not sure what the latest legislative update is, but in terms of the tools that we have at our disposal to track these things, you know, uh, like I said, we have tens of thousands of pieces that come through our platform every month. We have uh, human scanning of this, so you know it's not a foolproof system. You know we're not tracking things based on their geometry. Uh, it can slip through, uh, but we do use the human eye uh, as one element. And then uh, you know I'm not sure you mentioned the music industry, but uh, there's a, a team, a company called Source Three. Uh, they actually uh, tracked. Uh, songs, uh, copyright uh, in the music industry, 
um, and sold that to YouTube. Uh, they're actually trying to do the same thing um, with 3D files. They're trying to uh, track intellectual property, uh, 3D printable content. They're, they're looking at it from a monetization perspective. Um, those are two ways, and also uh, streaming. This is you know, an area that the industry has been talking about for, for a few years now, the ability to wirelessly stream a file, and that's supposed to be um, protecting the content uh, more. Uh, we haven't seen a product that we love yet uh, that dream. seems to be a, a little bit more hype. But um, you know, uh, uh, streaming uh, the the human eye um, and companies that are uh, focused on tracking the content uh, would be the three tools that come to mind. Yeah, as a content creator, I've streamed some files to customers before using some services. Uh, I've I've done it four times and had two problems, so it's it's not great yet, but. Also, there's no guarantee that that streaming thing's not going to get broken in the future and they'll be able to capture it. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's not a solved problem yet. You know, this used to come up when we'd go to Kinko's, remember? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we haven't really uh, had any problem yet, but uh, we do have documents that people sign, you know, attesting to the fact that this is their original work or, you know, that they have permission. It's really the best that we can do right now. And we will have uh, Tom Kirk from, from Source 3D uh, here later on, so 1.30. Next question. Uh, just a quick, because just make sure I have an understanding. When you talk about streaming, you mean like, so that if you come up with an idea and you sell it to someone else for $5, if you send them the file, they can print out as many of them as you want. You're saying streaming being like, I'm going to host the file, you can print it out, but you never actually get the file. Yeah, there's a couple services set up like that where I can okay. upload my file to a website and then someone can pay that website money and then that website sends a stream to their printer directly and it supposedly is safe that they can't make multiple copies but uh, they, they, there's lots of concerns and it's not a solved problem yet but yeah Thank you. I didn't even know are there other questions yeah with um <coughs> for 3d hubs with the uh with the growth in service bureaus and not even just kind of desktop printers but um also people having Two, three, four larger industrial grade printers um, find themselves a service bureau and they're you know, popping up everywhere at this point. Yes. Um, what does it look like, maybe 30 Hub specifically, maybe just in general, um, but the distribution model uh, for commercial and, and not so much as consumer? Uh, from the customer's perspective, the, the commercial? Yeah, and not even just consumers, but um, as companies uh, producing, say, low on. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, we've traditionally been looked at as a, a platform, again, 16,000 uh, plus printers uh, that uh, uh, has desktop machines available. While that's mainly true, over 90%, we have hundreds of uh, large scale service bureaus who have quite a bit of production capacity. Um, you know, Listen, the average order value uh, in, in that area is uh, 10x what it is if someone's ordering something at least at home. Uh, so we obviously see it as a large opportunity. Uh, you know, the way they view us uh, is a way to get orders. Uh, you know, it's a marketing platform for them. Uh, our, at a very basic level, we connect people who want to print with people who own 3D printers, whether that's a MakerBot sitting in your basement or whether that's at uh, a professional 3D print service bureau in Arlington, uh, we don't care. Uh, but we obviously, those guys need unique tools that are very different from somebody who's printing at home, uh, and we intend to give them to them. Are there other questions? This will be the last question for this panel. Just how big a problem uh, has it presented in terms of interoperability of prints and getting this consistency out of different devices? Are you guys running into that issue a lot? Do you see any standards evolving to help solve that problem? With the We The Builders project, the prints came in a variety of quality. So like some were great and some were really bad. But all together, they, it still makes a great looking part. If you look really closely, you can see the differences. But um, overall, it came out nicely. Um, what about it's a problem. Is, it? is, the, is, the, is the short <laughs> is the short answer to it? Um, it depends what it's being used for. I mean, a different printer is gonna is gonna produce a different uh, level of product, and even the same printer, you know, will spit out something different. Um, so uh, you know, there are big companies like Microsoft and HP that are looking at changing file formats because they think that's gonna help. Um, 
you know, I think it's a mixture of the hardware improving and the materials. And we didn't touch on materials here, but from a growth perspective in this industry, I think materials is huge, and anything the government can do to incentivize research in that area would be extremely useful. Absolutely. I think that um, right now, at the consumer level, we're limited in how big we can make something and the materials that we can make it out of. Um, and then there's an issue about uh, when you're prototyping, you know, you make mistakes. You have a lot of blobs of plastic, you'd like to reuse those. So we're talking with some of the manufacturers about how to immediately recycle and reuse um, so that we don't create more waste. Um, but, you know, there are, um, whereas there aren't standards, there's a lot of evaluation amongst users and sharing that information. Uh, Make Magazine does an annual review of the consumer level products and it's it's actually a good resource because they test them they test them amongst you know many people and there I see some of the testers in the audience here um, but that becomes at least a gauge because you have a lot of people who feel like they have to have this for their school or their home or their library and they're rapidly challenged with the upkeep and the quality and the, the sheer demand that's placed on the machines that they're really not, yeah. All right, so okay. I, um, I'm going to end this panel here. I'm going to do two things. First, ask you to please uh, thank the panel. They, they were fantastic. <laughs> we are going to take a, about a five-minute break to switch between panels. The next panel will be on medical applications. You heard about